Hi friends, welcome again to another episode of Beyond the Clouds Edge to Edge Transformation. And speaking of transformation, here with us is Vlad Moskovsky, a thought leader at Accenture. And I knew him when he was an aspiring a person who was helping people understand themselves. That was many moons ago. Vlad, tell us about your story. How did you become not only a thought leader, but an AI-empowered thought leader? <laughs> Thank you, Shankar. It's nice to be here. For many years, I was very dedicated to helping empower people. And I thought that the best way to do that at the time was through helping them be more self-aware. So I was teaching meditation, doing a lot of things with uh, workshops and classes. So I've probably taught about two and a half thousand classes and over 10,000 people. And at a certain point, um, that road led me down to working more and more with leaders. And because I passionately believe that the level of consciousness and the quality of presence and care, honestly, that leaders have makes a huge impact on so many people that they are working with or responsible for. And so that led me to the work of what I'm doing right now, which is I'm a senior principal at Accenture. My specialty is in talent and organizational design. And so that means that I get to sit with Fortune 500 clients and really support them in their efforts to transform their organizations, to keep pace with the fast speed at which our technology is changing, our world is changing. And it's allowing me to sit at the table and really have a direct influence over individuals who are managing billions of dollars of assets and responsible for tens of thousands of people. And so I work with leadership, I work with culture, and I work mostly with transformation. I remember the last time you and I met was uh, after Wisdom 2.0 in 2016, when you and I were also at the Center for Compassion at Stanford. And uh, I recall it was our common dream to see mindfulness and uh, meditation be a part of corporate culture. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, is that really happening? Are people much more aware and interested in these kinds of uh, methods to bring about uh, transformation in their leadership? And secondly, how successful have you been at it so far? This is a difficult topic for me to talk about. We all know that the rate of change is rapidly accelerating. And so what ends up happening is that the busier you are, the more fast paced your work environment, the more fast paced your life, it seems that there's a correlation with presence. The, the less present you are, the less in the flow you are, because flow requires a certain mental state, a certain biological neurochemical um, place. And I see mindfulness, compassion, these things are difficult to bring forth unless we slow down. Unfortunately, Shankar, people have a very difficult time slowing down. And when I look at the calendars of these leaders that I'm working with, we are scheduling 30 minute sessions two to three weeks out because that's how full their calendars are. So on the one hand, that's happening. And so in a way, no, they're, they're, mindfulness is not penetrating into the corporate world. It was, It is a fad in many ways. It is something that some leaders appreciate if they have time for, and most don't even really understand it. But what I do notice is that many leaders have a desire to be more present and more attuned, more sensitive because they understand that that's connected to emotional intelligence, which has been proven over and over again to be such a strong indicator of success. So in a way, the way that we can explore these topics is by changing our language a little. Whereas 10 years ago, I was talking to leaders about being more mindful. 
Now I'm talking to leaders about how present are you? How attuned are you to your people? Are you able to read emotional states in yourself or in others? Because if, if you're not very good at that, you're going to make mistakes. And it's going to be more difficult for you to keep being successful. So the languaging has changed. The intention is the same. That's wonderful. Uh, Vlad, uh, it is impossible to turn the wheel backwards and uh, go away from technology. So given that AI is becoming uh, pervasive and hardware, semiconductor, chips, systems are everywhere, is it possible that these technologies can actually help rather than hinder people, including leaders, towards being more present? Is it possible that we can use some of these technologies to actually help slow down? You know, it's funny. I was just having a conversation with some friends about this yesterday. I think AI has the potential. So just from an Accenture perspective, our CEO has announced about three months ago that we are going to invest $3 billion into AI technology and upskilling our people over the next few years. So that's a, an incredibly large sum of money to be investing on any scale, $3 billion. We are investing heavily in technology that helps automation, that is co-piloting for people. Lots of use cases, the most obvious ones are in call centers where people are um, able to leverage this technology to make their jobs in some ways more fulfilling. So I'll give you an example. Um, let's say I am at a call center in the Philippines. And my typical job involves picking up the phone and talking to someone. But while I'm talking to someone, I have to be looking at a computer to reference all of the materials, reference places where I can find answers to their questions. I have to be at the same time writing notes. And then when the call is done, I have to transcribe everything that took place to document it in a system. So now here comes a new technology that is able to listen, transcribe in real time, translate between languages just as easily, summarize, and it's searchable. And it's able to pump out templates of emails to write. It's able to enter information into systems. So that allows me to be more focused on the human-to-human -human connection. So in some ways, for that call center person, leveraging these technology might mean that my job is actually more fulfilling. At the same time, I think there's some other technologies at play that are very useful for people. So for example, um, you and I both know that coaches are extremely helpful in our lives, right? Like I've yeah. been coached and I am a coach, so I coach other people and I know you have also. Coaching is expensive. You know, my usual rate is more than most average people, let's say, would be willing to pay. So here comes technology that is able to have a decent coach be available to anyone, completely democratized. I think that will make an impact to make, it's strange to say, but I think in some ways AI can help some people feel more human. Wow, that's um, absolutely amazing. And I've been hearing from our friend, Dr. Jim Doty, talking about an empathic AI-enabled coach, and that would be wonderful to see happen. What about jobs and uh, career transitions? There's a lot of anxiety with all these changes that AI is bringing forth. Yes, it will make a lot of sense, uh, reduce the mundane stuff, but could it in the short term reduce jobs? What advice do you give to people who are going through these difficult times? I can speak to what I see right now, but what I see right now is very much in the context of the economical landscape where there's a constriction in the economy so that means companies are all constricting their budgets. I really like your question about what should people be doing instead of freaking out and worrying? Because I don't think that fear energy mindset is very helpful. 
So right now, the conversations we are having with our large Fortune 500 clients, which employ a huge amount of people, is they are focused right now on innovation, but even more importantly, they're focused on cutting their costs. And unfortunately, the biggest cost is always people's salaries. So I see clients wanting to save money. That doesn't always mean eliminating jobs. It could mean that they invest in this technology and therefore, as they continue to try and grow, they don't hire more people. I also think that they can realize value. If I'm a call center person and suddenly 30% of my time was spent on taking notes, now I don't have to do that. What do I do with that 30% time saved? Now, the tricky part is if I am only trained to do this very narrow thing, there's little value that I can add because even if I have 30% more time, what do I do with it? So my biggest advice to people right now, and I'm taking the advice myself, is learn, train, find ways to become more knowledgeable. You know, for example, yesterday I had some friends over at my house and one of them is a graphics designer and marketer. And she's telling me, oh, I'm hearing all this stuff about AI, but I don't know if I want to go there. I don't know if I want to touch it. I think this is many people. And and I, I told her the same thing. I was like, look, your job will not be eliminated as long as you are on the cutting edge. If you know how to do prompting well, if you know what mid-journey is, if you know how to use this technology, then you can up-level yourself and you can be much better at what you do already very well using this technology. If you don't, you will be replaced by that technology. We're talking about the democratization of technology, making ubiquitous uh, you know, applications in all walks of life, but is it going to make people's lives better or worse? Is it going to create these kinds of pockets of people with tremendously high compensation and a huge number of people who have nothing or become homeless? Or is technology helping or hurting democratization? Technology, I believe, always allows democratization. I think the biggest hurdle is what do people do with those technologies in their hands? Let's say I have access to ChatGPT for free, which we all do right now. But if I don't make use of that, then in some ways I don't benefit and someone else who does make use will. My neighbor, for example, was thinking about using ChatGPT to create short books. Uh, maybe children's stories, or maybe something else. And then using Dolly to generate images. And then packaging that together and then selling them on Amazon. So clearly there's a lot of children's books. I'm not sure we need more, but it's an opportunity to add value. And therefore, if you use a free tool that's been democratized, that's very advanced technology, and you add value you will benefit and other people will too. So it's really, I think, for those people who are listening who are not using AI, I think what I would ask you is what's stopping you from using these tools and how might you use them to benefit yourself and those around you? Because if you do that, you're going to benefit. You're going to see value. Will it help us slow down? Will it help us have better lives? I don't know. <laughs> I've never slowed down through the centuries. No, no. It's. I think, you know, for me, like I moved out of the Bay Area to slow down. So right now I look out my window and I see trees and I see forest. And when I see that, it kind of gives me this like, this like moment to pause. I'm not rushing, rushing, rushing. So I'm not saying everyone should move to a, a forested area, but how might we slow down a little? 
we benefit tremendously from that, but I don't know if everyone agrees with me. I agree with you. In fact, uh, uh, talking of technology enabling things, uh, you and I both moved to be more in nature thanks to the availability of tools like Teams and Zoom and uh, high-speed connectivity and the ability to work remotely. Uh, it would not have been possible even five years ago. What advice do you have for companies when you work with them on how they can make the most of the technology without leaving their people behind? Yeah, I like that, without leaving their people behind. What I see is they are thinking of their people, but they're thinking of their budget first. There's an opportunity here for creativity. There's a, a very famous um, comedian group called, that they created Monty Python and all of those movies. So John Cleese is the driving force behind that group of comedians in England. And he's been active for dozens and dozens of years. One of my coaching clients happened to mention him in a video that he saw about creativity. And so I went online and I found this video from 1997, still very relevant. The basic story that he tells is creativity is such a powerful tool. And right now, if everything is automated and technology can do so much for us, the thing that's left that's truly, truly human is creativity. This is what separates us from just a machine that right now we don't have machines that could think for themselves. Hopefully that won't happen for a little while. If leaders want to leverage this technology, they want to benefit and they don't want to leave their people behind. And that's the goal. You want to have profit and people at the same time. I would say invest in your capacity to be creative. And according to John Cleese, and I find this to be true in my own experience, creativity needs space and it needs time boxing. And it needs an open mindset rather than a closed mindset. When you have a closed mindset, you have a goal and you are focused on reaching that goal. Whether it's a task list or a destination on your walk. And so when you're that focused, it's very good because you can get stuff done quickly, efficiently, and you are moving and you're progressing. This is not a place where creativity can thrive. In fact, it pretty much kills creativity. And that's okay. We need a closed state in order to do and accomplish things. However, if you want to access creativity, you have to learn how to get out of the closed state in, into what he calls an open state. In an open state, you are quite the opposite. You're almost like a, a small child. Everything is open to possibilities. You have absolutely no goal or destination. You may have a wonder or a curiosity. So this is the place where inventors and scientists, people like Buckminster Fuller, Einstein, all kinds of creative people who come up with brilliant ideas, they know that in order to be in that open state, you can't be rushing. You can't have a to-do list. You have to lock yourself up in a cabin or a room away from the kids, away from the phone calls, away from the cell phone. And you got to have at least an hour and a half to two hours because the first half hour, your brain's going to be a monkey brain. And it's just going to keep pushing you to do all the to-do lists and the things that you've forgotten to do. And you have to tell it, no, I'm not doing that right now. And you have to sit there. And maybe there's a question or something you're pondering. Maybe it is the question that you post, which is, how do I make use of this technology in my context without letting people go? Or how do I empower my people to leverage this technology so that they can add more value to my company? It would be a broad, big question, not something easy to answer. And the first thing that pops to mind is probably not the thing you want to go after. And so I would encourage people to cultivate how to move from open to closed, open to closed, and dedicate that time to the open state, because that's where you're going to have ideas. And you can't do it in a boardroom with 15 people. 
You just can't. You got to have it by yourself or maybe two or three people maximum so that there can be really rich dialogue. And you can't be shutting down ideas. That's like the number one thing of innovation and creativity. And I spent a lot of time talking to leaders about innovation and creativity because they want it and they don't know how to do it. And it's about this open state. So true, so true. The interplay between open space and uh, having boundaries so we can get things done in space and time. At a young age, you got into these kinds of practices, it seems to me. And rather than partying, there must have been some reason what brought you into mindfulness, meditation, sitting in silence, which is not at all common uh, at, a, at a younger age. May I ask you what brought you into these things? Well, I got bored with all the partying. <laughs> <laughs> I love fun and playfulness and creativity. But also, I love exploration. Um, I think the world is full of wonders to be explored. It's what makes life worth living to me. And so I quickly looked around me and I realized, yes, this world is very big. There's an infinite places to see. And there's infinite people to meet. And there's infinite things to learn. And then what I realized was that there's also an inner world that's just as infinite. As deep as the ocean is behind you, the inner world is just as deep, maybe even deeper. And in some ways, to me, it was more mysterious than the ocean. I recently learned how to free dive in Mexico in this, these beautiful underground lakes called cenotes. And it was very special because you're going underwater, you're holding your breath, one breath, and you go under. The goal is to relax because your brain uses lots of oxygen. So the more relaxed you are, the more oxygen you have, the slower your consumption rate of oxygen and so you can stay under longer. But when I go under there, you know, I can expect to find fish and maybe some rocks. <laughs> And that's about it, right? And so in some ways, that deep mystery that I found when I went diving was beautiful, not because of what I would see externally, but because of the challenge of the internal. Is how much can I challenge myself to relax, to hold my breath, to not freak out about running out of air and dying underneath a cave in Mexico? How much can I attune to my inner world? and and connect with it and so as a young person i just found it fascinating to explore this inner world because it seemed endless i started doing and playing with all these things when i was 17 so now i'm, I'm 41 so that's over 20 years and after 20 years i feel like i've barely scratched the surface i i have a map and I haven't been to most of the places on the map. And I'm not even sure the map is correct. So to me, that's very exciting. Wow. Looks like your bucket list of things to explore in your inner world. Yeah. Well, I have two lists, really. <laughs> <laughs> I have the outer and the inner. But, but, you know, I try to balance them. Yeah. yeah. The, the inner is more interesting to me, I have to say. And it always has been. It's less tangible. There's more potential. Like right now, my wife is seven months pregnant. And so there's a little unborn human inside of her right now. Now there's this interesting question that comes to my mind. It's like, where is the consciousness of this human? Is it conscious? Is it intelligent? What, what is the experience of this unborn baby? Where is it coming from? You know, these are questions that are impossible for science to answer and may never have an answer. These questions are intriguing to me. I sure hope to see a book on conscious parenting from you, given <laughs> that you've been on this journey for so long. Uh, speaking of which, uh, you've been exploring mindfulness, uh, being present, being aware. Are there still things that keep you up at night? They don't keep me up at night, but I'll tell you one of the struggles that I have. I haven't done any courses in mindfulness or meditation in, in a long, long time, probably 10 years or more. 
just because I feel pretty solid in, in where I'm at and I continue to learn and grow. Um, recently, I found out about a course that I was impressed with, and so I enrolled in it. And just over last winter, I did the course. And I learned some new things, which was great. And I got to practice something different than I normally do. And so my struggle right now is I am very pulled right now into the outer world of projects, whether it's work-related or house-related or family-related. And I don't think that I dedicate as much time to just being instead of doing. I do a lot of doing and I'm getting really good at it, which is great. <laughs> I think it's very important to be able to do a lot, to hold a lot and not be stressed. On the other hand, this level of being where it, you're not doing anything, you're just being, you're just kind of ex in existence. I'm not doing so good with that. One of the things I learned in my explorations was that uh, the inner world and the outer world are completely connected. How we feel inside reflects how our attitude towards the rest of the world. And uh, what we do in the external world comes into our inner consciousness. Is it possible to bridge this gap that we all experience between what we do and how we feel and how we are in the external world? I, I completely agree with you. It's a question that I often sit with is what's the connection and how do they influence each other, right? Because let's say I'm angry right now because I've had a bad day. I get on a call and you'll know it. Like you can, you can tell Vlad's in a bad mood. It'll change our interaction. And if I don't let it go, then it'll possibly make our interaction not so great. And I won't allow myself to be influenced by you. Maybe you've had a great day and you're really happy and smiling like you typically are. If I let myself be influenced by you, then you can influence my inner world. And maybe you can remove the anger that I'm sitting with or the frustration. So in that way, I think you know, my job is interacting with people. Like, yes, I spent a lot of time putting together proposals and doing PowerPoints and things, but a lot of it is interacting with people. And so I often think about human to human interaction and how the inner and the outer are connected. So I think a lot about presence, actually. I get a lot of feedback from people about how I am easy to interact with and how they feel comfortable and safe around me. And I think maybe it's a little bit my personality, but I think even more so it's my presence. And I, I really value presence so much. And that means being inner attuned and outer attuned at the same time. Now that you've been a practitioner uh, at Accenture and in the corporate world over the last few years, uh, now that you are in the world of doing, you are in the world of uh, time, space constraints and getting things done, return on investment, has your practice as a coach, has that changed? Are you more in tune with the realities of today's uh, organizations and the way they operate? Yeah, I think one of the things that I'm really passionate about is creating resilient organizations what we saw was over and over again, companies grow and the economic environment changes and then they have to shrink. Or technology changes quickly. I'll give you an example that's very obvious, Meta. Facebook changed its name to Meta because it poured millions, if not billions of dollars into AR, VR technology. And then OpenAI disrupted the world by opening up ChatGPT, which had been in development for a long time, but no one really was talking about LLMs. And then suddenly, all of that investment in the meta virtual world is like old news. So now what do all those people, what do all those departments, all that money, all that investment, all that technology, it's not obsolete, it'll still keep going. But now suddenly, it's like the ship was going this way, now it needs to turn. How do companies do that? How do people do that? It's not easy. So I think resilience is super, super important.
My biggest passion right now, having worked with lots of Fortune 500 companies, is I'm actually wanting more and more to make an even bigger impact, which means working with smaller organizations. So for myself, over the next three to five years, I'm going to set my course to be a strategic advisor, consultant, and coach to companies that are in early stages and growing quickly. As an individual right now, given everything that I've done and all of my expertise in the talent and organizational space, this is where I can be the biggest leverage point for companies is let's say you're a small 30 to 40 person company right now. You're growing 30, 50% year over year. You have some money. You've got a product market fit. Right now is such an important time because you are shaping the culture. Is your culture direct or indirect? Are people more open to giving feedback or is that not part of the culture? How is your operating model structured? Are the business units empowered or do they all report to someone that holds budget? And what are all of those systems, structures, processes that allow you to scale and grow in a way that is responsive? And I'm really passionate about that. I think organizations all too often still are operating as if they were gears in a bicycle. And they should be much more operating as if they were cells in an organism that move and respond organically and rapidly. A bicycle gear does not respond to anything. It just does what it's designed to do. And I think every organization aspires to be much more like an amoeba than a bicycle gear. Most of them have no idea how to get there. And the only role models they've seen are other gears. Hierarchical structure, very solid business units, reporting lines that are very direct, people being told what to do and expecting being told what to do and not taking accountability, all of that stuff, decision making, it all shows up over and over and over again. So those are my passions right now. Working with the T-Mobiles and the Googles of the world, I make a tiny impact. It's a drop in the bucket. Working with a smaller organization, I can make such a bigger impact as I'm taking the learning from the giants and I want to bring it to the small organizations that hopefully will be the giants of the future, but in a different way that are more human and more organic. Your words are music to my ears. Uh, and to everybody out there, I'm always looking for different ways of looking at reality. Reality is not a bunch of gears. It's not a bunch of hierarchies. It is actually organic in every possible way from the water we drink to the air we breathe. There's life everywhere and we want to come alive. So please come forward, tell us your stories. And Vlad, it's always exciting to hear from you. And uh, I look forward to many more interactions with you. Yeah, thank you so much, Shankar. This has been a pleasure. I love all your questions. They're fascinating and interesting to think about. And of course, it's not like I have the answers. All of these things are so complicated. We have to make meaning for ourselves of all of this, whether it's technology or purpose in life or how to run our company. And I thought after two decades, you would be a guru by now. We'll see you again face to face soon. Thanks, Shankar.